I have no reason to doubt if that's true or not. You know, maybe he found it, and so here's the firstborn son, and he's sleeping, okay? And you're inside of the house, and anybody that's up, like the, the, the Jewish people were told to do what through the whole night? Keep vigil. They're not to go to sleep. They're to stand ready to leave whenever the Lord says go. So they're standing. But, and these people are all sleeping up on whatever, maybe things on the wall, you know, beds up here. Yeah. But the firstborn son is down here. And so the gas from this particular emanation, which he did, only the people that are sleeping down here died. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you think about it, he's the lowest pot. What's the problem with that? Gas rises. No, some gases are lower. Some, it, whatever this particular gas is, carbon monoxide or whatever, stays low. Okay? But some gases do rise. They're, they're different gases. But whatever this one was, and it, it, it's plausible. It is plausible. But what is the problem with that? There could be people who aren't first born laying down. Okay. Well, he's making the assumption that this is a generalization, that the firstborn are all sleeping on this special cot, so maybe some other people died. But generally, the firstborn died. What? Now, I'm saying that there's people laying down. Right, but what I'm saying is... didn't die. Well, suppose they did, though. The generalization is that the firstborn died, right? So you're, a few people that aren't firstborn that do die, big deal. I, I, you know, I, I'm just trying to think like he's thinking, but there's a bigger problem than that. Did you guys, what? Tell us. Well, go back and read that verse again. Which one was it? 29. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne okay. to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. And? Uh -huh. And the All the firstborn. Of so we have special bed for the livestock too. No, they'd be standing up. Of course, of course, this was a miracle. The whole premise is blown when you read the rest of the text, which he didn't quote. That's why you have to quote the entire thing, yep. and his whole premise is gone because of that. You see that? That's the problem with jumping to conclusions. And I hate to say this, but yesterday the sermon ended, or the sermon, we got a half of a verse about forgiveness and you can't do that because when you take a half a verse it destroys the context of what's being said father forgive them I'm sorry that wasn't what Jesus said for they know, for they know not what they do and that makes a huge difference first off Jesus didn't forgive anybody he said father forgive them and secondly they did it in innocence or ignorance Okay, it makes a huge difference in the context when you quote so a it verse. Goes to motivation. It goes to motivation, and not only that, can anybody tell me an example anywhere in the Bible where we are required to forgive without repentance? No. Ever. Never. You no. will not find it. Take one of those verses that people use, and I will dismiss it for you. I w Here's one forgiving everyone, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Okay, sounds like you have to forgive everyone. Take the rest of the verse. Yeah. Just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Jesus Christ forgave every person on earth. Potentially. Not actually. Exactly. If you say he actually forgave everybody, then why are we in church at all? Exactly. Let's do whatever we want. Go down to the Unitarian Church on Proctor and that's what you're going to get. So you have to be very careful when quoting a half a verse unless it can stand alone. And that verse could not stand alone in yesterday's sermon. That's not to belittle him. That's just simply saying that that leads people. And I can't tell you, when I did an analysis of forgiveness on Facebook, the people that emailed me actually crying as they were typing saying, I've never been told this ever. And yet this has completely changed my outlook because they're told in church all their life, you must forgive everybody. And what does that do? That causes us stress because there are people that offend us that have never repented and you can't forgive somebody that hasn't repented it is I don't care what anybody says it is impossible because they don't think they've offended you you cannot forgive somebody you can potentially forgive them just like Jesus Christ did or you have another choice and that's what Jesus did on the cross hand it over to the Father and let Him deal with it and yeah. that is what the Bible tells us to do the closest that you will ever come to forgiveness without repentance in the Bible is Stephen being stoned. And he does what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Father. Father, Father yeah. No, he doesn't really say. He says, don't 
hold this to their account. He doesn't forgive. He doesn't say, I'm forgiving you for doing this. No. He passes it on and says, I can't deal with this. I'm being stoned to death by these people. You handle this. And that's what we have to do because if not, you are, there's actually a tension between you and what you were taught in your doctrine and people get this in their lives and they don't know how to handle it. You take all of your problems and all of your frustrations and you say, God, I know that you can deal with this. I can't. So to say I am forgiving somebody, you can't forgive me. I haven't done anything wrong. But if somebody asks for forgiveness. If they ask, that is the model. And that, that particular uh, parable that he gave is the whole premise of that. If somebody asks, he says, you have to forgive them. You must, even, even if you think they're being dishonest, because you don't read their heart. And that is what he was saying. Up to 70 times 7, you must forgive them. And then he gives the parable. The guy owes him $3 billion or whatever he said yesterday. And he comes and he falls on his feet, on knees and he says, please forgive me. He says, I will. I will forgive you. And the parallel is we owe an infinite debt. We owe a debt that we could never in all of eternity pay. And all we have to do is ask for it. And he grants it. Now, when we turn around and we have a cold heart to somebody else, that shows us that we were not truly repentant ourselves. But repentance, true repentance, means that we must be forgiving of anybody that asks. Now, that is a hard one to swallow there. The other one isn't hard at all. They don't ask for forgiveness, and I'm not required to forgive them. I just hand it over to the Father, and I'm done with it. But when somebody asks, to, even if you're sure they're lying, Jesus says, you got no choice. But look what he forgives us. That's right. That's the whole point. We can't even begin. But to say, I am actually forgiving somebody that hasn't repented is impossible. It is simply not possible. That's the same thing as Jesus. I am actually forgiving you. No. He's potentially forgiving us. When we say, I am sorry, then he forgives us. That's right. That is, that is, because if not, then we're in universalism and this isn't, we're no longer in a Baptist church. We're down the road. And like I said, if that's the case, I, I say this once in a while, I may have said it in this class, the stupidest thing on earth to me is to be a member of a Unitarian church. Why? Why even bother? Why would you bother going to a church where everybody's saved? <laughs> What's the point? Socialize. Yeah, socialize. Well, you can do that on the beach. Why go to a crummy church to... to Go ahead. I talked to the pastor after service and I said, I think the one thing that you were missing in your sermon was explaining the meaning of forgiveness because so many people agonize. Over That's what I'm saying. That it means I must say that I'm okay with what this person did to me. That's so, not what it is at all. So, you are releasing your burdens right. to the Father. Right. Yeah. And. Yeah, what you have is you've got a cart and you've got a horse and you've got to put the horse somewhere and the horse has to go in front of the cart for it to move. That's all there's, that horse can push all day long and he's not going to move that cart. The horse is the repentance and the cart follows wherever that horse goes and that is the and you are absolutely right on that. You know, I'm not here to challenge people and I, I didn't mean to get into a long discussion about the entire sermon but that one thing, the point is a half a verse. And that goes back to this. You have to quote the whole verse if it is pertinent. And Jacoby, the naked archaeologist, didn't do that. And so that's why we... Ooh, it's time to go. Um, th that's where we ran into that problem is because he had this beautiful analysis. And everybody, I'm sure everybody that watched that particular uh, series went away content. Oh, well, that explains everything about it unless you read the Bible, and then it doesn't explain everything about it because the cows are standing there, the little kitty cats are sleeping with their mom. Yeah. doesn't say anything about that. The firstborn of every single creature died, and they're not given special beds. So, and plus, I do find this dubious, this low bed thing, but I can't, like I said, I can't dismiss it because I'm not in Egypt, I don't know anything about Egyptology, but I find that's probably stretching it. Not logical because the Pharaoh's position is up. So yeah. why would the bed's position be down? I don't know. You know, that's just what he came up with, and I have no reason to say. I, 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 in other words, I can't dispute that, but I sure can dispute the part when you add in the the people in the dungeon and the people that are in the uh, uh, or the cows and that livestock. All of a sudden, then it becomes disputable. God really, really, really sent the angel of death through there. This wasn't anything other than that. And I am certain. You want one miracle that is absolutely miraculous in the Bible. 
That is it. I'm telling you. I, as I said, the Red Sea is a great miracle because there were 603,550 people standing there waiting be, to be delivered, and they were delivered. But it's not a miracle in the sense that it explains how it was done. He sent an east wind all that night, and it parted. And as I said, you can see that in my house. 50 days a year, you can walk across Sarasota Bay, except where we dredged out the inner coastal. Okay? It, it, the, the bay is this deep, and all of a sudden, it's empty. Not a miracle at all. The miracle was that the people were there right when it happened. That's the miracle. But this here is not just that it happened at a certain point in time, but it also happened by the finger of God. I'm telling you. that. There, wow. And there are other miracles. I'm not saying this is the only one in the Bible, but I'm saying that there is no other explanation that I can think of that is naturalistic in its, yeah. you know. Anyway, there you go. Uh, uh, anybody want to close this in prayer?